I'm Luke Gygax. I'm the organizer of uh, GaryCon, an annual convention that's held in the honor of my father, Gary Gygax, the uh, creator of Dungeons and Dragons. Even though it's a small convention, a lot of people that come here have been in the gaming industry for decades and have a lot of history. Like a lot of people here have designed lots of games, so it's it's like a big family reunion. Or yes, you did the right thing. That was absolutely the right thing. So you lost by doing the right thing. You did. To get together and play games and have fun, especially uh, some of the older game systems. You know, we honor the roots of our history. See old friends, make new ones, play new games, play old ones. That's what this is all about. Well, I'm Peter Atkinson. I'm the owner of Gen Con, which is another gaming convention. And um, I used to be the uh, CEO of Wizards of the Coast, a company I started back in 1990. Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, and Dungeons and Dragons. And those were our three biggest products. And there's my office there. What's this, man? What's a uh... What battle is it? Stefan Bacorny, I met, uh, I think it was uh, like around 1999, 2000. One of the things that we both do is both being in the gaming industry, we would go to various gaming conventions uh, around the country. Stefan likes to go out and party, you know, likes to go out drinking a after the show's over. So do I. So we kept finding ourselves as like the last two people standing. <laughs> Finally, we're like, hey, it's you again. Yeah, who are you? What and then we started like calling each other. Are you going to that convention? Yeah, let's let's meet up. So we're industry professionals who met because we both like to have fun, uh, not just gaming, but going out. And then we just became really close friends after that. Oh, this is uh, this is the Death Star, I think. I think it's Tie oh, Fighters. Oh, they're going into the Death Star. Coming in, Red Five. <laughs> just breaking up, but pulling out. <laughs> Stay on target. I also respect him as a businessman, even though he comes across as like a goofball. Use the force! Trust in your feelings! He's an amazing artist, and he's an artist who has uh, managed to retain control of his intellectual property. And so I just respect that he's built this company up without being sort of the type of guy you would expect to be running a business as big as Dwarven Forge. These are the actual heraldic signs of their families? Yeah, yeah, this is our this is our coat of arms. Coat of Basically. arms. It's awesome. I don't know if you ever actually met. I'm Stefan Pacorni. Yeah, I've I seen you on uh, Facebook. And make the terrain. And all that. He might know I love what you guys do. When we were when we were playing in the early 1970s, the sand table was what was available for us. And you used to play with Gary? With the Gary Gary guys here. Wow. He's the one that actually taught me how to how to use chainmail. In the words of Shakespeare, brevity is the soul of wit. This is Chainmail Rules for Historical Medieval Miniatures by Gary Gygax and Jeff Perrin. Jeff is still he's kicking around here. I wrote a book called Chainmail, which was a set of rules which evolved into Dungeons and Dragons. They were published in 1971 and it was those rules that enabled you to have the actual battles with the toy soldiers using dice, et cetera. And prior to that, nothing else was published. It is mass combat, where one figure equals 20 men, man-to-man -man combat, where one man equals one man, sieges, and a fantasy supplement, all in one little booklet. The actual historical section is approximately 17 pages. Medieval warfare was my, my scope on that. Because I like the knights and the Saracens and all that stuff. Boy, this would be a great game to play with this collection I had bought and it just went from there. At the time, I lived in Rockford, Illinois, south of here. And Gary lived in Lake Geneva. He got really hooked on um, these miniatures I had and, wow, this is neat. <laughs> and, so we developed the rules and had the games. And then he and Dave came up with a role play element and called it Dungeons and Dragons. A character could become a greater character, that hence the role play. Dungeons and Dragons is a role playing game, it's created in the early 70s, where you play, you and your friends play characters in a story. There's a game master who's like the primary author, but 
the control of each of the characters in the story is turned over to the players, and these players all make the decisions as to what their characters do throughout the course of this story. How many players do we have at the table? Uh, Three, six, seven, eight, eight, eleven. Eleven, okay, we roll over under twelve. Okay, player six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Young man, what's your armor class? My name is Ernest Gary Gygax, Jr. My heritage is that um, I was raised by a gamer. Dungeons and Dragons was originated and created in my dad's den. Wait, level three, how many levels are there? This is massive. Every computer game that you play that has a reward system and more hit points or more whatever, that's, that's my dad's real legacy. We were heading over to Frank's party. Okay. Frank Spencer, are All you right. heading over there? Probably not. I've got too much stuff to do. You gotta, yeah, you gotta run the fucking the convention, of the, course, yeah. right? Now, if one of you could help me out, there are two boxes marked dice up there. One of them has red and white stripes, and the other one has something on top. If you can get the bottom of the two out, <laughs> unfortunately. This is, a, <laughs> this is a challenge, of course. What these are are prototypes from the early 1980s, before there were suppliers for this stuff. Uh, one of the things I'm guilty of in my past is writing the line of Dungeons & Dragons box sets that was the best-selling version of the game in the 80s, back during the boom. You know, of course that was the best-seller. And we're talking tens of millions, uh, by some estimates 40 to 50 million copies of the works were sold. But to have enough dice to put one set in each of those box sets. You know, you gotta have, somebody has to be ready to make a hell of a lot of dice and on relatively short notice. This is real raw early prototype stuff. Up until that point, we were using this blue. These are in the 1976 and 1980 sets, but then we ran these prototypes, this and these, and you can see the pearly white sort of, this is just simply raw original plastic. And we checked out the molds and the work on, you know, whether they would roll right, whether everything is balanced. You know, you cut different numbers out each side, you don't know whether it's perfectly balanced. You know. And then you add some color to the plastic and you run a bunch more. Because you don't just run a couple of dice. You have plastic injection molding machines and all this gets very complex. I and another guy named Harold Johnson, we were the, we were the only two people to keep track of obscure details of how we produced modules, how many we would produce, the different editions, printings, because we had a feeling that this was someday going to be important to some people, and sure enough that it became a global phenomenon. And then I see like 10 people standing here in my office drooling over these <laughs> prototype dice. Apparently I was correct in my guess. Yes. Ancient treasure. Treasure from an ancient crypt. Frank was showing and giving us ancient treasures. Not from Valoria, but from TSR. Treasures from the vaults of TSR. Now we get this stuff. Huh? They're nice. They're not quite the same, though. See? Prototype, modern age. Did it? Now let's see which one rolls higher. <laughs> Oh, a one! My dice boloed. And a 12. See? Usually when you roll one, it's really bad. <laughs> Burn that die immediately! <laughs> Stefan's my favorite loony, and I mean that in the most loving fashion. I grew up gaming, if you will, with no scenery. We didn't have scenery. We didn't even have figures. If it got into a confusing fight, the orcs were all the white dice, and you're the orange die, and I'm the blue die, and he's the red die. I learned to DM in the theater of the mind. I worked for Gary for five years. I was the first employee of TSR. I was hired to be his editor with the understanding that we would start the magazine at some point, which we did, and I edited all the early uh, Dungeons and Dragons stuff and uh, all the supplements, that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, I knew Gary real well. As a group, bonded by the Brotherhood of Gaming, we're focusing on the social aspects, those aspects of the game that are people talking to people, relating to people, playing the roles. I grew up with a sand table where we would spend hours putting, you know, grass and, and trees and all this stuff so we could then play battle after battle after battle. Stefan provides things that you can take 
mix and match and whatever else. What we picture in our minds and draw on paper, he puts it in visualization that you can touch, see, and feel. You don't even have to have as good an imagination when you have Stefan's products. Stefan's not a bad dude either. We're getting ready for the game. The D&D &D game. I'm here to run three D&D &D games. I'm a, I'm a special guest to run games. And we're gonna utilize these pieces. We need, we need a tabsy shop and we need a monster sewer set. When you're playing a game like Dungeons and Dragons, you like to set up the terrain of where this battle is gonna take place, where you know the monsters are gonna be. Wasn't this where the, uh, you decided to put the staircase here? Yes, yeah. It helps visualize it to have these beautiful art pieces that create any sort of configuration that you would like. That's the tapestry shop of deceit. It gives that representation of what the train is, where you're at in the terrain, and uh, and it's beautiful. You know what? We can even put a door. Okay, just the second floor. We could put some doors in here, man. It takes it to another level. I mean, it's really detailed stuff. I like the fact that uh, you can build it. It's customizable. It's really great stuff. This is the Cadillac. You know, this is this is the the premier quality. Uh, uh, material that you can have for a setting. It's, it's, it's the gold standard. Garrett speaks up, he says, I, I know a place to enter into the sewers, and then I can lead you to some of these places where she might be hidden. Well, I for one am ready to start slaying these vile creatures. Obviously, the beautiful settings that are out there, I mean, we'd expect that just given who he is, right? But he also does sound effects, and then he puts on a little costume and he'll make sure to do some voices, even if they sound, you know, silly or whatever. Who is it? Uh, it is Zorbo, lady. He's a, a very theatrical dungeon master. And before I go in, I will put my torch up high and clear <laughs> the oh. lintel before As I walk in. you put the torch up, you notice these rather large creatures ah. up above. This big looks like giant cockroaches. Yeah. Oh my goodness. One of them drops down and, and, and roll for initiative. Oh, <laughs> darn it. Character, uh, plot development, the story is very important. And uh, he physically gets into it by doing a little bit of some of the theater type stuff. He puts on the amulet and suddenly tightens up around your neck. Oh. And, and you watch him in horror as, as he starts to turn green and starts crunching around. Oh, 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 the claws and he, and he grabs it and he starts furiously cutting it. And he manages to cut it off. And you throw it to the ground and as you watch it, you see that the ends that were broken slowly slither together and fuse themselves. Being an artist, Stefan, is a person that has a better imagination than many others. Stefan's got a big heart. He's a lot of fun, you know. He's, he's really uh, got a great sense of humor. He gives it tons more energy than I'm able to generate anymore. <laughs> he's just having a great time, and he wants to share his great time with you. And in that regard, he and Gary share an inclusiveness of the, come on, play my games, and let's have fun together. That's part of why I love him. He's, uh, he's, he's absolutely naked, no pretense in his enthusiasm. And I wish more of us were like that. The great thing about the knee is, is you're supposed to make stuff up. You know, that's what's great. And that's why Gary was so a genius in that way, was he left so much stuff open. You know, and I hear sometimes people say, oh, you know, he didn't figure this out, he didn't figure that out, or he didn't explain that. Well, that's what made it great. It was because you got to make the rest up. You made your own homegrown rules for it, and that's what made it your own. And that's why you loved it so much. And, and isn't that useful in life? Yeah. Because you that, tell me, yeah. I mean, as a leader, exactly. people don't come to me and say, oh, well, here's a solution, by the way, to this yeah. uh, difficulty that we're having. You have to figure it out, man. Yeah, you have to come is. up with your own stuff. So I think that really helps people develops that skill. What is it about role-playing games that's special, or, uh, that's literally magical, and for me, it's that the character's failures are just as magnificent as their successes. A lot of people have difficulties in life, they feel like a failure. When they get involved with a hobby where failure isn't bad, this is absolutely life-affirming. It helps you deal with failure, and adversity in ways that other pursuits 
that only cherish success uh, don't do. So it, there's a lot of people that uh, can identify with that. To Gary Gygax, to Gary. Gary, you brought us this great game, you know? Yeah, Gary. Oh, yeah.